Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live severe weather briefing discussing the threat across Dixie Alley today. There is a slight risk across central and southern Mississippi, all the way up through northeastern Mississippi, northwestern Alabama, and into central Tennessee. A few days ago, this risk was an enhanced risk, uh, but there has been some changes in the models and the forecasts. A bit of a late arrival of the moisture. Moisture is definitely one of the limiting factors that's going to prevent a more substantial uh, severe uh, weather outbreak. However, I do still think that there is a legitimate chance of tornadoes, especially along that surface low track that is going to track from east central Louisiana across central Mississippi into the northeastern part of the state, eventually northwestern Alabama, possibly eventually into central Tennessee, but it doesn't look like the instability is going to make it that far north. Still, though, with such high wind shear, you can still have relatively marginal instability and still develop a tornado threat, especially with these QLCS uh, type situations. But I do think that the tornado threat is going to be maximized with any supercells that can anchor along this surface low track, uh, likely to the east of the Mississippi River. Uh, those cells will probably start to get going uh, near that surface low track to the west of Jackson, probably between Jackson and uh, Vicksburg, and then will lift off to the northeast, possibly as far north as even the Tupelo area. But again, as I mentioned, that moisture is a limiting factor. So far this morning, the instability axis is way down into southern Mississippi. The dew point at Jackson is already in the low, is in the low 60s, but it's about to spike up into the upper 60s as that uh, pool of moisture is surging off to the north, almost like a density current in a way. And uh, that is heading, uh, uh, when that instability axis, the nose of that uh, merges with the surface low, that's when that tornado threat is really going to begin. And I do expect that to be maximized between about the 3 and 7 p.m. time frame there. The greatest tornado threat is in the yellow. I tried to uh, encompass the surface low track with this target area and also the immediate area just to the south of that surface low where there could be a couple of additional supercells that can capitalize on that greater wind shear. So let's start out with a quick satellite loop. Uh, this image is from the College of DuPage site here. You can see uh, there's still a, a ton of cloudiness across a, a large part of central and northern uh, Louisiana into northern Mississippi. Uh, the warm front is still way down to the south. It's likely just crossed into the far southwestern part of Mississippi. You can see some of these low uh, convective elements or a little bit of cumulus streamers. Uh, here streaming uh, parallel with that strong low-level jet, but that's how you can pick out where that instability axis is and it's just lifting to the north into southwestern Mississippi and as that instability axis noses to the north, once it merges with that surface low, there certainly is a chance uh, that there could be a tornado threat. Here is the latest surface map and you can see those upper 60s to near 70s dew points that are just to the south of the Jackson area. Jackson right now is a 61 dew point, 61 over 66. Uh, the upper number, uh, that's the temperature. The dew point right below it, 61. And you've got some pretty backed winds too. You've got surface winds that are out of the southeasterly direction. So when you have a, a low level jet that's out of the southwest at about 40 knots just above that, that's creating really strong low level shear. And there's plenty of deep layer shear for supercell modes as well. Instability though is really the limiting factor. There is some warm uh, temperatures at 700 millibars too that I think are going to prevent uh, prefrontal renegade supercells from developing. So it's likely going to be along that main convective line along the front. There's probably going to be one long track HP supercell that's right underneath that surface low that moves off to the northeast and right along that surface low there could be just enough moisture and uh, wind shear uh, to get a pretty robust tornado threat. And you can see these dew points surging north through the Mississippi River Valley, funneling to the north like that. Uh, you've got a 68 dew point down here in Natchez, uh, right near the Vicksburg area, you're already spiking up to a 64. Uh, the, uh, at the Pig and Pint uh, there, the barbecue place in Jackson, you're about to spike into those upper 60s. You've got a, it feels probably a little bit cool right now. Uh, the clouds are starting to lift, those low clouds. And then once that warm front blasts through, you'll start, well, before it blasts through, you're going to see a light area on the horizon off to the south. And that's as those cloud decks will lift. Uh, the instability will build. And you've got temperatures in the mid-70s to the south of that warm front. And really what it's going to take is for this instability axis to merge with that surface low uh, before it ejects from uh, east central Louisiana. The surface low is right about in this region, maybe a little bit even further north than that. And uh, you've got the warm front down like this. 
And uh, is, so th this nose of, in, of uh, instability and greater dew points is about to co-locate with that surface low as it lifts off to the northeast like that. And it, uh, it, it is um, the reason this is a slight risk and the reason why the tornado threat is relatively conditional is it depends on whether this nose of those greater dew points can stay coupled with this rapidly ejecting surface low. There is a chance that the surface low could eject so fast that it'll outrun that instability axis, leave it a bit behind. That's what I mean when I say that the instability axis looks a little bit pinched off, and uh, that's because the surface low is going to move off to the northeast, and that's going to prevent the instability axis from staying coupled with it. But I do think there is going to be a window for tornadoes during that 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock time period with the surface low in Mississippi during that brief period uh, when the moisture axis is merged with that surface low. So this was a... Uh, this is uh, from an old uh, HRRR run, and I wanted to illustrate with this uh, the, the nose of the instability axis and really just uh, how modest it is. You can see the sharp northeastern edge of this instability axis. And usually with those really intense, intensifying upper level systems that are transitioning from a positive to a neutral to a negative tilt as they enter Dixie Alley, usually those will lead to a huge instability axis and continue for a few days pumping that moisture northward. This one, though, matured a little bit early. The system is already positively tilted. It's already shearing out upon ejection. And there just wasn't enough time uh, with a, a robust low-level jet the day before uh, to really bring this instability axis northward. There was also a lot of severe weather and a lot of heavy rain along that west-to-east-oriented stationary front. That certainly didn't help the cause. Uh, but the, generally, you need upper 60s dew points uh, to, to realize a tornado threat uh, during winter in Dixie Alley. And uh, even though this instability axis is a little bit modest because of the system shearing out as it approaches uh, Dixie Alley, there still is a nose of instability here where those mid to upper 60s dew points that are forecast to surge north up to that surface low. This is at 22Z, so this is about 4 o'clock Central Standard Time. And uh, the HRRR had the surface low pretty far north. I'm not sure if it's going to materialize that far north or if maybe a, a, a little bit further south uh, track would seem a little bit more realistic uh, based on how uh, the wrap has uh, been evolving the instability axis. But really, this is a skinny instability axis, a, a nose arriving late to a rapidly ejecting surface low. So there are a lot of uh, failure scenarios, thankfully, for tornadoes not to happen. For example, if this instability axis doesn't make it in time, the surface low ejects off to the northeast, then you're just going to get mainly a skinny squall line uh, with um, the lack of, uh, of one of those dominant supercells that moves along with that surface low, as we saw in the last Dixie Alley event. And as we often see with these events, it's usually a, a good idea as a storm chaser to target that surface low track, but it often is an HP supercell or high precipitation type of an event. Fast moving often. You only get one shot at intercepting it because usually there's just that one storm that is right over the surface low. And in this case, with all that warm air coming in at the mid-levels, the threat for renegade cells to develop out here to the south of the surface low out of the squall line looks to be pretty low. So now I'm going to show you a loop or I'm going to loop, we'll, we'll go one, one frame by one frame at a time. But this is the latest wrap forecast cape. And this is a good way uh, to pick out that warm front. It's probably a little bit further north than is indicated here. These are run uh, every hour, but the mesoanalysis is definitely a favored tool of mine. And you can see this little funneling north of the moisture along the Mississippi River Valley and ahead of that uh, surface low where you're likely getting a little bit of an enhanced low-level jet and the terrain encourages the funneling of the moisture up the Mississippi River Valley like that. The low is likely up into east central Louisiana, maybe even northeast Louisiana near uh, the town of Monroe, possibly near the I-20 corridor. And it's still a little bit decoupled with that surface base instability. So there's just a little bit of distance between this warm front, which is rapidly, well, we'll call this the boundary of the surface base instability, which would basically, basically be the surface manifestation of that uh, warm front. Above the ground is probably a little bit further north, so sometimes you'll see these uh, moisture axes or instability axes uh, jump off to the north like that and even get a mixing down of moisture, but that's usually more of a Great Plains uh, type of a situation. And uh, in this case, you probably do have the 850 millibar warm front 
a little bit further north. But this surface low is expected to move off to the northeast like that. So let's step forward uh, two hours. This is at, at noon. So right now it's 12.30 in Dixie Alley. So this is about a half hour ago. Uh, you saw that Vicksburg was already up to a 64 there. So that front probably is moving a little bit faster north than it looks. This is two hours later. So this is at 2 p.m. And you can see that the instability axis jumps off to the north especially along the Mississippi River Valley just before the surface low ejects. By this time, which is about, about 2 o'clock, I would put the surface low pretty close to the Mississippi River. Uh, you've got a little bit of a surge of the warm front out ahead of it as you have a, a little pop in the low-level jet. And even the wrap shows the hint at a, a surface low storm developing here, probably just to the northeast of Monroe, maybe in the Vicksburg area. And, uh, and you, you, you'll be able to track that enhanced convection all the way along the surface low and the wrap as well. Here's two hours after that at four o'clock and you can see that more robust storm in there. It's incredible that these high resolution models can resolve this but you kind of just have to look if they have the idea of what's going on. In this case the strongest convection is right with that surface low. So that's the surface low storm. The HRRR also shows a dominant storm that's coupled with that surface low lifting off to the northeast. The wrap also shows surface base instability starting to build out ahead of the surface low in northwestern Alabama. That also, also favors tornado potential. And so now let's go a little bit further towards 6 p.m. And look at that surface low storm. And by this time it is pretty close to the Tupelo area. But one thing I noticed on the wrap is that that surface low storm looks a little bit decoupled now from the surface base instability. And so by about 6 p.m., that's when I expect the tornado threat to begin to die out. That's why I have it until 7 p.m. on the, on the uh, official target area. And then you can see that as the surface low ejects off to the northeast, it's going to leave the instability axis back behind. And that's what I, I mean by the instability axis, axis pinching off. And you can see on the wrap and as supported by the HRRR, there is a relative lack of renegade supercells that develop out ahead of that front. Uh, even though the atmosphere is strongly sheared to the low levels, especially up in the northern part of that instability axis closer to the surface low, there's just not going to be any storms, it looks like, um, out ahead of that squall line. So now I'm going to show you a loop of the low level instability, or the low level shear, effective storm relative velocity, basically in the lowest kilometer or so in this environment. And this shows that wind shear is not going to be a limiting factor for tornadoes. And if there are surface-based supercell storms that are able to form in this environment, a very strong wind shear, they would become tornadic quickly. But the thermodynamics just are not yet supporting storms. You can see on satellite that you just have these streamers of cat cumulus lifting off to the north parallel to the low-level jet. But those cat cumulus congestus are being limited by relatively warm mid-level temperatures. But still, four, five hundred, six hundred storm relative helicities, more than sufficient for even a strong tornado threat. And watch how the uh, helicity lifts off to the north with the surface low. So basically along and just ahead of that surface low track, that's where the greatest wind shear is located. So by two hours from, uh, from the first image, that's 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. You've got a blob of maxed out storm relative velocity just ahead of that surface low, which is by this time pretty close to the uh, Mississippi River. Probably will have a supercell that's starting to mature along it. Similar to how the last event unfolded with that one HP supercell right over the surface low that tracked to the north of Jackson. I think to the north of the Canton area too near Pickard. That one uh, caused quite a bit of damage. Very difficult storm to chase because it's co-located with that surface low. Still, I wish I was out there. It's just traveling from here to there for a marginal setup. It can be difficult to do. And I feel like my skill set can be better served by breaking down radar, breaking down the environment, streaming live as the outbreak unfolds. But I definitely want to be out there. So now let's go a little bit further to 4 p.m. And look at how that instability blob moves along with the surface low. So by this time, it's uh, until to the south of Tupelo, possibly near the Oxford area. There could be a blob of some enhanced helicity, and you're going to have 
The uh, surface low anchored, or the, the supercell anchored underneath that surface low that's going to move into this environment. And it really shows you why that surface low is where you want to target. Also a pretty scary site here for northwestern Alabama is you've got a lot of effective low level helicity available for these storms as they're getting that instability axis or surface based instability developing well out ahead of that surface low track. That's why I probably should have extended my target area into northwestern Alabama as well. Really in that area, I think Tennessee is going to be too far north to get a legitimate tornado threat. Although with these skinny squall lines, sometimes you can develop kinks within the line and uh, you can still get quick spin up tornadoes. So anytime there's strong wind shear, anything can happen. But you can really see this helicity blob that goes along with the uh, surface low. Textbook, textbook Dixie Alley surface low chase. And usually in these you get one long track tornado producer. Actually Yazoo City, that chase back in 2010. Long track EF4 was also an example of a storm that's anchored along a surface low like that. So you see these all the time. And whether this turns into a big tornado outbreak or just one dominant storm depends on how well the environment out ahead of the front can destabilize at the mid-levels. The wind shear is always strong out ahead of the front. So anytime you get renegade storms ahead of the front, you're going to get a tornado threat. But in this case, the models are just showing a minimum of renegade storms out ahead of the front with this setup. Now let's uh, look at radar really quick, see if anything is going to catch us by surprise. I don't think there, there will be. You can see these little popcorn showers that are located to the south of Jackson. Just moisture advection happening. All of these little streamers here are capped by warmer mid-level temperatures, so they organize parallel to the low-level jet. Sometimes these can grow into renegade supercells out ahead of that front, but in this case, the models just are not showing that to happen. Let's look at the main front. This is it right here in Louisiana, and you're starting to get some convection developing in uh, East Central, even Southeastern Louisiana down there. These have a chance to grow into storms that could be co-located with that surface low. These will lift off to the Northeast and probably near the Vicksburg area, I could see one of these convective elements developing into a mature supercell that's anchored along that surface low that'll probably lift to the North of the Jackson area. Usually the surface low will track along that stationary front or the warm front uh, that is lifting northward out ahead of it. But right now, I'm just, uh, I don't see anything that's going to be an immediate storm. You've also got uh, these storms along the primary front that are about to move into Lake Charles. But really, it's the this mode right here that could evolve into an eventual supercell closer to 2, 3 o'clock. Uh, in the vicinity of that surface low. So that's my breakdown of this setup. I hope you guys enjoy my weather reports. Uh, I'll definitely be in the field every opportunity that I get. Uh, but this setup just seems a, a little bit too uncertain to go uh, all hands on deck and to launch sensors and to get the dominator out there and to start shooting our, our new series as well. So I'm kind of trying to find the, 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 the most intense two to three Dixie Alley setups between now and the end of March uh, to target uh, with the sensors and everything else. Uh, so you just kind of have to pick and choose. If you deploy too early, like a setup like this, and exhaust all of our resources and we miss all the tornadoes, then we have big problems. Uh, but I'll usually go out there by myself anyway to storm chase these. And uh, likely I would start in the Vicksburg area and track that surface low storm. One smart thing to do if you're storm chasing this would be even to start up way off to the northeast, maybe in your Tupelo, and just wait for this thing to come together and move rapidly toward your location. I would say just to the south of Tupelo, and then uh, maybe inch southwest if it looks like that surface low storm is going to start producing a little bit earlier. But thank you guys so much for joining me today. If you do live in this target area, Certainly stay tuned to those watches of the warnings, and I'll be live once this uh, severe weather event starts. I'm going to be doing radar breakdowns, uh, discussing the environment that these storms are moving in, comparing it to this forecast. But really, you got to watch out uh, for these surface low tracks. 
And uh, definitely please consider the Facebook supporter option to support live briefings like this. I do these every day uh, for the Facebook supporter community. Uh, we also do live storm chasing too, which is going to really ramp up uh, during the spring and the summer, especially when I'm with the Dominator as well. You can see us launching rockets live into the storm. Uh, so thank you guys for joining me. Thank you, Facebook supporters, and never stop chasing.